Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Melissa Jones, and I've been an admissions coach with Fortune Admissions for the past 10 years. And I'm here today with my colleague, Cassandra Pittman, um, where we'll be talking about insider insights on how to get into INSEAD and LBS. Uh, Cassandra is also a coach with Fortuna. And um, although we've been working together at Fortuna for, for the last few years, we also used to work together at INSEAD on the, the marketing admissions team over 10 years ago, I think it was. We go way um, back, Melissa, you and I, yeah. we go way back. <laughs> Yeah, we both we both used to live in Paris and commute to the Fontainebleau campus, and uh, and both had amazing experiences working there. Um, but Cassandra also used to work at LBS in uh, marketing admissions, and is also a Columbia Business School alum. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're thrilled to be speaking to you today about what I would say are our two two favorite schools. Even though we both coach on all of the business schools, uh, we might be a little bit biased and love. Or at least for me, love um, working on LBS and INSEAD the most since we spent so much time there and really understand the culture and what it truly takes to, to get in. Okay, so just a little bit of an introduction on, on um, Fortune Admissions, if you're, in case you're not familiar. So we're in an MBA admissions consulting company for the past 10 years, and we're made up of a dream team of former admissions directors uh, where we have around 40 coaches now. And between all of us, we've come from, I think it's around 36 business schools from around the globe, most of them being the top business schools like um, Harvard, Stanford, NCAD, LBS, and, and so on. And so we're always happy to speak with candidates no matter what phase you are in the admissions process. So if you're interested in getting support on your business school applications or um, or you just want to chat about your school selection or your resume and or how competitive your profile is for business school, you can sign up for a free consultation anytime at uh, fortunaadmissions.com. Today, we will be speaking to you about what is so unique about INSEAD and LBS, what both schools are looking for, how to stand out in the applicant pool, and some common mistakes that Cassandra and I have seen over the years, and then we'll do we were going to do a Q&A at the end, but we're happy to take questions throughout the presentation. So after each after each topic, after each slide, we'll try and address just a, a couple questions. All right. So um, over to you, Cassandra, on what is so unique about INSEAD and LBS. Yeah. Well, you know, first first is um, there's. Uh, a lot of similarities between the two programs, but also some important differences. So let's talk about some of the similarities. First of all, they are both, you know, consistently ranked global top 10, often ranked global top five. So you're in you know, world-class top tier uh, school. Um, they are two of the most international top 10 schools um, of any of the pool you can be applying for. And, you know what, I really felt this pretty acutely when I did my MBA at Columbia, which was also a great experience, but I was in the most international cohort of the most international US school and it didn't stand a chance against the uh, international communities at either INSEAD or LBS. Um, so highly diverse cohort from around the world and that's something they're really looking for is that international motivation. Um, both give you access to global career opportunities and global alumni networks. Um, and that is, again, you know, in, in contrast to a lot of the other schools that you might be looking at where, of course, they do have a global network, but it will be highly concentrated in one country or another. You won't see that concentration um, so much in, uh, in the LBS or NCAD communities. Now, the format is, is really where it's different. Um, so for NCAD, it is a, a very accelerated 10-month program uh, with two intakes, one in the, um, you know, the winter, which is January, the other in uh, September. The September, um, excuse me, the, the January intake does have a summer break for two months, so it actually makes it 12 months in total, but 10 months in class. LBS follows more of a standard two-year format or close to two-year formats, but does have these early exit, uh, exit points if you want to front load your your courses. So that's what that's what I had prepared, Melissa. I would I would love to um, have your experience. You were actually on the Fontainebleau campus longer than I was. Maybe you could give a, a little bit more flavor to that to that international experience. 
Sure. Yeah. So, um, well, I guess to, to, to start, uh, INSEAD boasts over, you know, 70 to 580 nationalities in the program, because I would say LBS is, you know, closer to 65 or so. Um, so as Cassandra said, yeah, you won't be able to find that level of diversity in, in, any, uh, in any other top um, uh, MBA program. And I guess one of the things that INSEAD, uh, well, you probably already know this, but they have the three fully integrated campuses. So one, the one in France, the one in Singapore, and then uh, more recently in Abu Dhabi. So students can actually go between those three campuses throughout their 10 month program. Whereas I guess for, um, in terms of the internationalism at LBS, um, even though there is just the one campus in comparison, there's, there's tons of exchange programs that you can do to over, I think it is 30 schools. Um, and LBS also offers like the, a unique global um, experiential courses where you actually go abroad for a full week led by faculty offering like a really in-depth view of the country's business culture. Um, so in terms of, yeah, just more of the international side and uh, the access to global careers, Cassandra mentioned, so top firms and recruiters are coming from, um, they're coming to campus to recruit, but, but they're really recruiting for their multiple locations around the world. But I think, I think one of the most um, important takeaways that each school has is the global al alumni network that you'll have, which they come from just about every single country. So your network will be huge. Uh, so students and alum alike use the network for professional and personal reasons. And um, there's uh, alumni associations set up in many of the countries. So even post MBA, you can still join, uh, join these associations and feel connected to the school. Um, and um, so you're not only connected to the school and the, the people you meet from different years, but you can use those networks for future job searches and, and careers. Just go on to the next slide here. Um, so what are both schools looking for in applicants? So Cassandra, you speak to the academic capacity and leadership potential. Yeah, sure. So, um, and there are some questions I, I see already in the chat about um, oh, how yeah, good sorry. my GMAT score really need to be. And I think we're going to address that here. So GMAT is one element of what these schools will be evaluating against your academic capacity. And another way to say that is how well do, can you perform in the classroom? You know, both of these programs are academically rigorous. INSEADS is, is incredibly accelerated, so you don't have a lot of time to catch up if you fall behind. And they need to be sure that you can succeed in the classroom. So they're going to be looking at GMAT score as a part of that, but they're also going to be looking at any other academic work you've done. Graduate, um, graduate programs or bachelor's programs, plus anything else you've done that can demonstrate you can succeed in a classroom. You might have taken um, uh, MBA core or something like that. Um, you're gonna wanna put that all together and, um, and they're gonna be looking to assess that. So there is no cutoff at which you should say, you know, they won't look at you. The, the direct question is, you know, could I possibly get in with a 650? I have definitely seen people get in with a 650. You wanna get your GMAT or your GRE score as high as it can possibly be. Um, they will also be assessing your leadership potential. And this is, I think, true for LBS and INSEAD. I think it's true for, for all the top programs. They wanna know that when you leave, you're going to make the most of your MBA and really be a leader in your field. The best way to assess the potential you have is to look at what you've done in the past. Have you taken opportunities to step up to leadership roles? That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have been a manager, but have you taken those opportunities to lead a project, um, to, to lead a team, to potentially um, get involved in some uh, non-work related experience where you've had the chance to really lead an initiative? Those are gonna be the kinds of stories that you wanna tease out in various aspects of your application, the essays, um, the recommendations and your interview. Melissa, can I, uh, can I pass over to you for international motivation and ability to contribute? Sure, yeah. Um, so we've spoken a lot about internationalism um, for these schools, but uh, so when, when you, in terms of your application and in the essays, what they're really looking for is, um, you know, for people that have worked abroad, studied abroad, um, uh, maybe you deal a lot with, with uh, international clients at work, or maybe you've done a lot of travel or you speak a lot of languages. Um, but I think the most important thing is in the essays, like if you don't have a lot of that experience, 
um, you really need to show that motivation that you're that you're interested in working abroad or um, post MBA. Um, um, and then, of course, INSEAD also has a very unique language requirement, <laughs> which can be tough for some. But uh, you do need to speak two languages to be admitted to the program, um, one fluently and then one at a, at a practical level. And then you need a third one at the basic level by the time you graduate. And then in terms of ability to contribute, so what we mean by that is, um, you know, how, how will you be contributing to the school overall through the classrooms or outside of classrooms? So are you the type of person to get involved in those discussions in class? Will you get involved in the student life outside of the classroom and certain clubs? And, and also, will you be an active alumni post MBA? So there's, a, there's two essays, um, sorry, there's an essay in, in each application um, that really gives you a chance to show, you know, what you've done in the past. Uh, maybe you've contributed a lot in your undergraduate program or master's program or, or beyond. Um, if they see you contributing there, then they'll hopefully that will show that you'll contribute to the schools uh, while you're at school and then beyond. Well, let's take a few questions then here. Um, so Bab Babji, um, it's a bit of a specific question with a 61% in an undergrad, I guess, uh, a grade and 12 years experience. I don't wanna get into too much specifics. And you, if you do have um, specific questions about your profile, once again, we're happy to chat with you at Fortuna and do, um, um, do an assessment with, with you. But just in general, I guess, for those that are worried about an undergraduate score, both schools are really looking for a balance between a GMAT or GRE and the undergrad. So if you do have a little bit of a lower score, you really wanna try and get um, a really high GMAT or GRE score. And then in terms of work experience, there isn't really a, a cutoff per se. Um, the average for LBS and INSEAD tends to be a little bit higher at like six, seven years of work experience. 12 might be a little bit more on the on the higher end. Um, um, so there are some programs that are, well, you could assess if you're if, if it could work for a full-time MBA or an executive MBA. It's really something where I think we would have to assess that on a, on a case-by-case basis. Um, yeah, Cassandra, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, no, I think that that covers it well. I think kind of if I can take a step back from some of these very specific questions about, you know, this is my score on the GRE and you know, this is the GPA or what have you. Um, I really wanna encourage you to take a step back and consider these four points and think about what's all of the evidence I have to demonstrate my academic capacity. What's all of the evidence that I have to demonstrate my leadership potential? And you know, even if you write it out, put it on a matrix, right? And then and put your points in there, maybe your, your positives and your negatives. You'll see that what you're trying to do is craft a, a whole picture of who you are and the strengths in these, in these four buckets. And that's why as, uh, as, as frustrating as it can be, and I've, I've been in your shoes, I, I had to apply myself, as frustrating as it can be to not have a definite answer. Well, what are my chances with the 650? Or what are my chances with the 700? Um, the truth is people get denied with high GMAT scores. People get in with low GMAT scores. It's really about can you demonstrate the attribute they're looking for and what evidence do you have of that? So there are no hard and fast answers on this, but you know that you have to demonstrate the, the overall academic capacity. Okay. I guess, and there's, there seems to be another common thread here about your years of experience in the program. So um, I guess in general, Cassandra, minimum is usually around three for these schools. And then really, as I said, there isn't necessarily a max. Um, yeah, I would say if, you, if you've got more than, let's say, seven, eight years, you, you're probably on the cusp and you should be considering mm -hmm. the, the executive MBA, um, maybe potentially alongside the full time. So you should be looking at the pluses and minuses. You know, if you have to look at the average age of these programs and the average year's work experience, part of what you are um, gaining from the MBA is what you learn in the classroom. But a lot of what you are gaining from the MBA is the network that you have. And if you, um, you know, spend all of this money, all of this time investing in this experience, you want to be sure that that network is going to be one that's valuable to you. And those cohort, that cohort you're in is going to be a cohort that you can learn with and learn from. So you want them to roughly match your experience. And so that's why it's not that, you know, 
NCAT or LBS doesn't want people who are older on the program. It's not that. It's that you want to be in that cohort that you are, that's going to be a cohort of peers that you're going to be able to learn with and grow for, grow, grow together. Um, and so I would say if you're at that seven, eight, you know, year mark, definitely start considering an executive MBA program. There's a little bit of an overlap between the executive and the, and the full-time you're getting to like 12 plus, you're almost certainly going to be in that, um, in that executive pool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, I do see a question here from Rahul, maybe Cassandra, you can address this a bit more. Can you emphasize more on international motivation? Yeah. So, um, so Melissa, I think you, you did a great job already of um, displaying the kinds of things that the um, schools are going to be looking for. Have you worked abroad? Have you studied abroad? Have you, um, you know, worked with international clients, et cetera? And that's really because, again, the best way to assess what you are truly interested in is seeing um, to what extent you take advantage of the opportunities that you have already had to gain that international motivation. Um, both of these community, or sorry, to gain that international experience, excuse me, both of these communities are communities of people who really value um, international diversity, having a global perspective, want to learn about business from a global point of view, don't want every case written um, from HBS with an American perspective, right? Um, and then you want to be sure that you fit into these communities. Now, not everybody um, has had the same opportunities to gain international experience, right? Melissa, I'm sure you and I can both talk about, um, we've worked with um, clients helping them, you know, on their business school applications, who grew up the children of diplomats, right? And they, they've got this international experience in spades. Others have never had the opportunity to travel outside their home country. Yeah. Um, so what is important is that you tell the story about why this experience is important to you. If you've had a lot of international experience, it's not necessarily enough to have had it. You still have to talk about why that experience was important to you, how you've learned from it, how you've grown from it. If you haven't had it, you want to talk about why it's really important for you to gain that experience and why that's part of the reason you're applying to, to business school. I don't know if um, if you have anything more to add on, on that one, Melissa. No, I think that's uh, we've covered that. Um, I'll just move on to the next slide here, so, and it will address some of the next questions that I see in terms of how to stand out, uh, which will also cover some, some people's questions on extracurriculars. Uh, so Cassandra, maybe you could start here in the first uh, three bullets. Yeah. Um, okay. So the first thing you want to do is uh, is plan ahead. You don't want to be rushing your application in uh, two days before the deadline if you can uh, avoid it. Mm -hmm. I have actually worked with a client who did an entire NCAT application in uh, three and a half days. Oh, me too. <laughs> neither one of us slept a lot. Um, uh, it's it's not the way you want to go. Not fine. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I what I'm really appreciating about this group is that we are obviously, you know, I know this is recorded, but we're recording this at the end of October, plenty of um, space before the next deadlines. And I'm sure some of you here will be thinking about um, rounds or indeed even years in, in the future. Um, so you are all one step ahead. The reason you want to plan ahead is because you want to give yourself time to do the introspection, to really understand what is unique about you? How do you want to tell the story to these, your story to these two schools in a way that demonstrates your fit and makes the best case for your candidacy? Now, both INSEAD and LBS are long applications compared to some others. Mm -hmm. So both are gonna be roughly 3000 words, give or take. That's wonderful because it gives you more space to tell your story. But it also means that, you know, you need to be really cognizant of how you use those essays and how you use that space um, to tell the right stories in the right spaces. And one thing that, that people can sometimes be inclined to overlook is just how important it is to consider how your letters of recommendation for NCAD, that's two, for LBS, that's one, um, fit into that. Right, because you want to use your recommendations to be part of that overall narrative, not to tell the same stories that you're going to tell in your essays, but to tell uh, related stories that also fill the gaps that that you aren't going to say elsewhere. And so we really recommend that very early on in your process, 
you um, are coaching your recommenders on why you're applying to these schools, what they're looking for, what they're going to be asked, and the kinds of things that, that have come to your mind um, that they can say. It's really important to, to do that early. Um, uh, again, Melissa, I don't know if you've had these, um, these anxiety producing stories, but I have on occasion worked with clients who are um, chasing their recommenders down hours yeah. before the deadline. And it yeah. is so stressful. Uh, you really want to save yourself that anxiety if, if you can. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, so yeah, let me hand it over to you to talk about career vision. Sure. Yeah. So both schools have essays where you get a chance to write about your career aspirations. And it's really best to not be too vague here. I've seen um, essays in their first drafts and someone might say, you know, they want to start their own business. Well, it's a bit too vague. So, you know, what, what kind of business and why, like, what's your passion around this career goal, whatever it may be. Um, and really schools want to know, like, what kind of impact on the people or communities or the world are you trying to make? So you really need to flesh this out. LBS's entire first essay is really around your career vision. So it needs to be clear and really come across as achievable. And then same for INSEAD. It's a little trickier for INSEAD. You only have 100 words, which is super short. So it needs to be very factual and as clear as possible for, for example, like include what kind of potential title it could be post MBA or some sample company names, uh, company names that you're interested in working in, and maybe even mention geographic le uh, location. Um, I know for some people, it's really hard to know what you want to do post MBA, but you really do need to show um, that you've done your research and, and that you have a plan. Uh, one thing that we do at Fortuna that, that helps people that might be a bit stuck and, and unsure what to do, we offer this, this career vision course, uh, which really makes you think and do the research. And, um, you know, it can, take, it can take quite a few days to kind of complete this course and do the research on your own. Um, so it's a lot of introspection and some things really might come up for you that you hadn't really thought about. So if you have a chance to do something like that. Um, make sure you yeah, put a, put in a, um, do a lot of self-reflection on this and do a lot of research so you can come up with a viable career goal um, that would make sense to, to admissions. And then uh, another big part is to be authentic. So um, as Cassandra was saying, like in some of the essays, you have a bit more of an opportunity to show um, to share, share your stories and really your, your personal side. Like we, they wanna know about your past a lot of the time and what motivates you, what are your values? Um, so the more real and vulnerable you can be sometimes, the better. Uh, I had this, this interesting example where I've been working with this candidate, he's a male Indian consultant with um, a lowish GMAT and he applied to several business schools last year and was rejected from all of them without an interview. And so we're working together this year on um, reapplying to most of those same schools, some other new schools. And I had a chance to read his previous applications. And I found that they were very professionally oriented and, and seemed like too much on, you know, what admissions would want to hear. And after I got to know him um, and after some time, like he's extremely nice, warm, caring, really funny. Uh, and I felt that that none of that shown through in his, in his application, you know, his, his, um, his voice and personality wasn't present at all. So I really made a focus this time around on including, you know, besides all the wonderful things he's done in the past, in the past, in his career and extracurriculars, um, but really like got his personality into, into the, the, the essays. And, and um, so far he's been invited to interview at all the business schools, which he's applied to. So it's super exciting. So just to show you that just these little tweaks like that of being authentic and true to yourself can, can really help and go a long way. Melissa, there's a, there's a question from the audience here um, yeah. from Varun asking, um, how important are extracurricular activities to, to LBS? And do you need to like, do it officially, like have a certificate or right. earn some kind of badge or can it just be something to a hobby or a passion? <laughs> Yeah, extracurriculars are extremely important for both schools. Uh, you'll see that in both um, both schools' essays, there's uh, opportunity to share what you what you do outside of work and some of your hobbies, um, because also you know they want people that will get involved and and they're not just about professionals. So you know if something that you were engaged in previously, let's say it was in your undergrad or you were the president of this association or student council, then, you know, they would see you as getting involved with the, with the school. So you don't necessarily need to have a, a certificate for any of these things. 
Um, I mean, usually you won't have something like if you were on the basketball team for years or you're the, um, you're the team captain, you know, you won't have, you won't be able to really prove that. So it's not necessary. If you have proof for some of the organizations, great. You can always attach those with your profile. Any other questions, Cassandra, that you saw around those topics? I think none on how to stand out, um, but we might come back to some of the other ones that are, that are in the chat uh, as we go through the slides. All right. So let's talk a little bit about um, common mistakes that Cassandra and I have both seen over the years. So yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So I think the first one, uh, I, uh, I'm really drilling this point. I hope you get it, <laughs> is, uh, is don't rush your application. Um, you know, I think it's such an um, important point to, to really hammer home, Melissa, on that, that authenticity. And um, there is, God, who is it, that famous writer who wrote a quote, uh, the quote goes something like, um, you know, I, I would have written you a short, shorter letter, but I didn't have time. And uh, it's really hard to tell your story in the space of words. You know, these, these essays are sometimes you know, two, 300 words. And, um, and you have to work hard to, to be able to display that authentic voice, everything you want to say about yourself, your accomplishments, your leadership, what, your, what drives you. And you can't do that if you rush. So please don't rush. Give yourself, give yourself the, the space. Um, the other thing is really be considerate about who you choose as your recommender. And there are, there are two things that um, I, I want to highlight on your choice of, of recommendation. So one is you know, somebody who really knows you, right? That, that may or may not be the most senior person in the organization, but somebody who can really comment, again, with authenticity about um, your growth, the impact you've had, et cetera. But the other aspect, which I think sometimes gets overlooked, is just how enthusiastic uh, is this person going to be in their recommendation of you? And when you read a lot of these, uh, and, you know, Melissa and I have read a lot of these, you start to just really recognize these patterns between um, a recommender who is, you know, being polite and kind and probably truthful and writing a recommendation and one who you just think, wow, this person really wants this candidate to succeed. They are just really in their corner. They think this person is like amazing. You can really feel that difference. So don't just choose you know, the, the person that you think is, you know, the most senior, et cetera, really choose that person who knows you and who is just in your corner as, uh, as an advocate of yours um, is, my, is my strongest recommendation. Maybe I'll, I'll hand over to you, Melissa, to talk specifically about, um, about common mistakes we see with INSEAD. Sure. So the first is, um, is around, um, so there's there's a there's a there's career essays for INSEAD and then there's the motivational essays, and the first motivational essay is uh, probably the most challenging out of all of INSEAD's essays, and it's um, the question is give a candid description of yourself, stressing your personal characteristics you feel to be your strengths and weaknesses and the main factors which have influenced your personal development, giving examples when necessary. Um, so even though they say it right there in the in the um, essay about personal development. A lot of times I find people focus a little bit too much on the professional aspect. So when you're asked about a strength, it's common to kind of divert and say, you know, what are your strengths in the workplace or in the office? And same with weaknesses. Um, so you really just, um, you really just want to focus more on, uh, you know, what we were saying before and being authentic and vulnerable and really sharing your stories um, like what, what makes you unique, what motivates you. So often even going back, like way back and speaking about, you know, what uh, your upbringing was like, for example, you know, what, um, did you have lots of siblings or what did your parents do? Who, were, was anyone an inspiration for you in your life? Um, you know, what did you do a lot as a child? Were you one that was always reading books or uh, creating new things in your bedroom all by yourself? Um, you know, like a lot of engineers, um, you know, might be building some, some complex things as a child, you know, which might might be kind of amazing for admissions to read, or um, were you always playing sports, or you know, so a lot of those things, you, you know, made you who you are today as a child. So kind of think back. You can use stories from the past, um, and then maybe even as you age and get into you know your teenage years or 
an undergrad, um, it's also a great opportunity to talk about any travel experiences that you had and, um, you know, the times where it became really culture, culturally curious and to, can talk about your experiences on a on an exchange or what have you. So really try and focus on like a per, on a personal story. Um, it can even go in chronological order if you want, or you can have a lot more creativity with this with this essay, whereas a lot of the other essays are a bit more factual. And someone asked here, I guess relates to my, my previous point around injecting like your personality into the essay. So that this essay in particular is a great one to do that. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, yeah, just just like instead of writing so professionally, you know, write as if it's just coming from you, like as a diary. Um, use exclamation marks if you, you know, if you're making a joke, if you have a um, a sense of humor. Um, it's just it's just things like that, just to make it come, make it seem more real as, as opposed to kind of this professional note. So I hope that answers your question. Um, and then there's the answering why INSEAD everywhere in, um, in the essay. So INSEAD actually doesn't have a question, why INSEAD, like a lot of other business schools, like why are you choosing LBS? Why are you choosing uh, Columbia Business School or whatever? Um, they used to have this question, but they took it out a few years ago. And so what, um, what they're, and why they did this is I think a lot too many people are just, you know, writing what they found on the website and they weren't really gain, learning much about the candidate from, from that specific question. So they don't want you to really be injecting the why INSEAD into these other questions because it's not, it's not what they're asking. So really make sure you answer what the specific question is and save the why INSEAD for the interview part if you make it to the interview phase. Um, and then in terms of there's a achievement essay and a failure essay, it's grouped together. So they ask you, what's your biggest achievement and what's your what's a failure that you faced? It's around 400 words. So you have, let's say, around 200 to answer the achievement, 200 to answer the failure. Um, a lot of the times, uh, in my opinion, I think it's best to, to show something prof um, professionally as opposed to personally. Not always the case, but I just find that that can often work well. So um, you can use a professional achievement that, you know, where it has lots of good quantifiable results, like a really good outcome, and then what you learned from that experience. Um, so not choosing things like getting into my undergraduate school or getting like a really strong GMAT score, as it's just not not as interesting. And, and a lot of people are in, you know, have um, it took a lot to get into their undergrad. So we want to make something that's really unique. And then same with the failure. Uh, often, often it works if it's a professional example where something that where you might have made a mistake at work, uh, where you were specifically accountable for that. I know it's not always easy to to kind of share that kind of um, thing with admissions, but it's all about how, what you learn from that mistake. And maybe it was something that you did earlier on in your career. Um, maybe it was a, a job right outside of once you graduated from from undergrad, as opposed to just using something. Um, once again, like um, a failure for me was getting low undergraduate grades or, or a bad GMAT. I just could never get a good, uh, a high GMAT score. Um, and then in terms of the optional essays, so there are two for INSEAD. Uh, one question asks um, if you plan to leave your employer a few months before the start of the program, what will you do during that time? You don't really have to use this essay if you're not planning on leaving your employer, totally fine to leave it blank, a lot of people do. It's just an opportunity for you to mention something that you might do if you were to leave your job early. Let's say it's um, you've always wanted to travel more or do some volunteer work abroad or something like that. It's nice to, to volunteer that information there. Um, but as I said, it's okay to leave it blank. And then there's the other optional essay that says something around, is there anything else that you wanted to share with, with admissions? Um, so this, this um, you don't necessarily have to use either because there are so many questions in INSEAD, you probably were able to, to relay most of the information about your past, past experiences. Um, but this is a great opportunity to mention something that you might've missed, like, Maybe you have a startup on the side, some, some side hustle. Um, maybe your partner's applying with you, so it's a good opportunity to write that there. Um, maybe you use it for why you didn't choose your current supervisor as a recommender. 
Um, another option, a lot of people use it, is to address a low GMAT or a GPA in undergrad. Um, maybe you just couldn't get that GMAT score up there, but you really are really bad with standardized tests. Um, but you can really use this to maybe address, you know, how you're using quants and verbal skills at work um, or may, and maybe highlighting some, some strong grades that you had in undergrad that were all very quant heavy. So just a few examples there. Okay, over to you, Cassandra. Yeah, so for, um, for LBS, it's, uh, this is one of those areas where the schools are a little different, right? So mm -hmm. Melissa has just said, um, you don't need to wax lyrical about why INSEAD in your INSEAD application, that yeah. it's really about you know, uh, who you are, and then they will probe why INSEAD uh, if, when you get invited to interview. LBS, not so. Um, LBS wants to, you to, to tell them um, how LBS is going to fit into your career journey. And they ask that specifically in the first essay. You know, essentially, the first essay is about um, where do you want to go and how has what you've done in the past plus the LBS MBA going to get you there. And what they're looking for when we say LBS love is for you to go one level deeper than just my general management skills that I'm going to gain are going to set me up for success, right? They want you to show that research. And this goes along with this third point on the slide, which is bringing in the knowledge you gain from engagement with the school. You know, definitely attend the events that they have, talk to alumni if you can, um, if you have people in your network or otherwise, you know, reach out to um, the officers of clubs that you might wanna join and get that level of, knowledge that's a little bit deeper than what you can just get by reading, um, you know, a cursory few pages on the website. And then use the space in this essay to talk about it. And the second thing that's very unique about the LBS application is that although it's actually quite a long application, it's, it's very deceptive because um, it looks like it only has one essay, but in fact, there are, you know, many essays, what we call open-ended questions um, throughout the application. Nevertheless, um, you should use your optional essay, and that is very different to um, to LBS, or I'm sorry, excuse me, to INSEAD or to a lot of the U.S. programs. Um, it's not just there for you to talk about a weakness. Uh, it really is there to complement the rest of your story. So it's 500 words, uh, and um, you should think about using that as an open-ended essay to, to tell what else you want to tell about your story. Um, now, there was a question um, that I, I saw earlier on. I'm just scrolling up a little bit um, to talk about, um, you know, mistakes people make if they have a very high GMAT. Like, why wouldn't those people um, get in? I've got some thoughts on that, Melissa, but do you have anything specific on high GMAT, rejected? Um, what are the common mistakes somebody might make if they, they thought they had it in the bag because they scored so well in their GMAT? Right. Well, it's what we were a few slides back around the, the four key criteria that the schools are looking for. Academic capacity is just one uh, one part of that. So I'm guessing if, if this person was rejected, um, they were probably missing other things like extracurriculars and really showing passion for the school um, and so much more like in terms of what they've maybe what they've done professionally and talking about career progression and accomplishments they've had at work. So yeah, so I'm 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 thinking that there was just too much too much focused on the academics and and not much on other parts of um, of that person's background. Yeah, I think the other thing to for people to keep in mind for NCAD, LBS, and and any top school is virtually everybody who applies is great, right? <laughs> everybody who applies has you know good academics, good GMAT or GRE, good work experience, and so it's it's your job and it's a hard job. And, uh, and that's why it can be so helpful to work with somebody to not only um, make the case that you meet the criteria, I call that your ticket to play, right? So your, your 760 gets you on the pitch, right? Yeah. You're playing the game, but it's everything else that's unique and different about you that help you stand out amongst that pool of really competitive where everybody is great um, applicants that will really be the difference between uh, a positive and a negative outcome for you in, in, uh, in a lot of cases. And so 
I think over relying on, well, I got a great GMAT, I have a great job, of course I'm going to get in is, is a mistake that I see. And Melissa, you know, you're already working with somebody. It's a little bit of a different case, but you're working with a reapplicant. And at Fortuna, we do see a lot of reapplicants. Um, and that is a mistake that I see uh, a recurring. Say, like, well, I thought it was great. How come I didn't get in? And it's because you haven't really taken that time to understand your narrative and, and what sets you apart from this really competitive pool. Yeah. Did you, um, in terms of the engagement with the school, Cassandra? Yes, I did. Yeah, I mentioned that at, uh, yeah, uh, as part of the first bullet. Oh, okay, right. Yeah. Um, I know that there was a question around gap and gap years. If you've had one, maybe it was a year off work or two, um, and how that will affect your application. Yeah. So... Uh yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was just, I was going to say it's very common for one. Um, a lot of people either take the time off to travel, explore the world, you know, before they get into their career, or maybe it was um, something more personal and, and um, health related. It's absolutely fine. Um, ad admissions are, are, are people too. They understand if there are certain circumstances. They also understand that people want to explore the world. It's their international school. So they fully believe in that. Um, as long as you address it, like there's no hiding in the application, they might see the the gap on your CV. It's hard to address that kind of thing in your resume. Um, so in the schools, they have an opportunity where you can address that in the INSEAD application form itself. It's not really a main essay, but you can address any gaps you've had in your profile. And then for LBS, um, yeah, you can also, you can use that. There's an opportunity to do that there as well. Mm -hmm. Or you can always use optional essays to addra address these kinds of things too. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, again, you know, taking a step back from from somebody's personal situation, um, nothing is a deal breaker in the same way that nothing is going to be the single thing that gets you in. Right. And so it's again, I mean, I, I feel like I'm kind of repeating myself here, but it's really all about how you tell that story and what you know, if you have a gap I mean, what have you done with that time? Um, and, and how have you used it and how can that be a part of your story that you are using to display your international motivation or your leadership potential, et cetera. Um, so again, think about these life experiences you've had and how they fit into to those criteria. There's a question here I see around, um, is it a, a myth that LBS generally is known for a finance program? Um, and specifically said, what is the scope and exposure for strategy and consulting? Cassandra, you want to take that? Yeah. Um, so I think that um, if you want to be a consultant or you want to be a banker, both LBS and INSEAD can get you there. Um, I also think that it's true that um, you'll have more people going into finance, uh, certainly as a percentage of the class, uh, from LBS simply because of its proximity to the financial capital of Europe. Um, and you will have more people, both in numbers and in percentage of the class, going, uh, going into consulting from INSEAD. Um, so just because a, a school has a strength or it has kind of a critical mass of people who, uh, who go into a certain field doesn't mean that that's the only thing you can do or that you can't be set up for success in, in another field. There are plenty of um, consultants or people going into strategy from LBS, just like there's plenty of people who go into um, investment banking from INSEAD. Okay. All right, we're just gonna look through some of these questions to, again. So now is the time for, for we'll, we'll just leave it at the Q&A. Um, we have a few minutes left. Yeah. Cassandra, did you see any earlier that you wanted to address? There's a question here. Um, how important is your IR score on the on the uh, GMAT, Melissa? Hmm. Yeah, um, for these two schools in particular, they didn't start looking at the IR really until a few years back. So it's not um, as important as the verbal and quant score. They're really looking for a good balance between mostly the, the quant um, and the verbal. I guess on average, um, for the schools looking for like 75th percentile approximately for on both. Yeah. And um, how do you, th uh, how important um, is diverse work experience? You know, for example, working in the U S and, you know, EU, um, um, you know, so maybe across countries, across industries, do they want to see that diversity of work experience or do they want to see progression in a, in a single place? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I, I'm sure, Cassandra, you've seen you've seen both, right? <laughs> I've Absolutely. worked with with people that have been at the same company and you know had four or five different titles um, from the from one company, and then another candidate who jumps from industry to different titles to yeah to different functions. Like you know, you've seen it all, and um, I don't think there's a, you know a right or wrong way. A lot of times, people that are moving around a lot just may not know what they want to do and they're trying different things. And I know that's what it was like for me uh, when I was starting out. And um, so I think for, I guess, when you are jumping around a lot, um, it does, it does bring up some questions for admissions. So uh, luckily, for example, in INSEAD, you've got an opportunity to really discuss your, um, your career, not progression, but um, um yeah, where where you've where you've gone, where where you started to where you are now, you have a chance to walk them through that and give reasons as to why you switched. So as long as you can give uh, a reasonable explanation, um, then it's then it's totally acceptable, you know, to be to be moving around quite a bit. But the career progression is also looks really great. Um, all schools want to see that you've obviously been doing well if you have certain promotions, and it's often great to mention, you know, why you were promoted to that next position. What was it? What was it that you did at work? And maybe you could comment on, a, on an accomplishment that you had there that got you to that next position. Mm -hmm. Cassandra, I don't know if you have anything to add on that. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head. Um, uh, again, everybody is going to have different experience, right? And it's about how you tell the story, keeping in mind the criteria that the school is looking for um, and telling that in an authentic way. And some people might have had a lot of diversity in their work experience and some people might have um, been doing the same thing since they graduated, but they're still going to need to tell that story of progression. So it, it's all in the narrative. Yeah. Okay. So we're just looking through a few more questions here. I don't know if any new ones have come in. I'm just scrolling back. Um, what do you think? Is it um is it an issue if a candidate is actually on a career break? Maybe they've taken some time off to prepare their GMAT or something else uh, when they apply. You think that disadvantages them, Melissa? Yeah, that's um it does come up quite a bit. Uh, yeah, it's it's a bit hard to say. I mean, generally, it's best to be in a be working at the time that you apply. Would you agree, Cassandra? <laughs> Yeah, all things being equal, uh, it, it's it, it's better to be working. But if you're yeah, not working, yeah. you know, you need to be doing something that is more than um, preparing your GMAT. Why? Because um, everybody who applies to these schools has to take the GMAT or the GRE. And most of them have to do it while working full time. Some of them have to do it while working for time and, you know, caring yeah. for a family and all sorts. Um, and so um, while, you know, the GMAT and the GRE are uh, just incredibly time consuming. And that is the truth. Um, it doesn't read that well to say, well, I needed to take this time off to prepare it, right? Knowing that other people with very demanding careers have done it. But people um, have applied successfully from career breaks. Maybe they need to take a career break, as, as you mentioned earlier, Melissa, because of their health um, mm -hmm. or a personal situation or, um, you know, a, a, a personal aspiration to go and learn a language or to spend a year um, on a personal project. Um, those kind of things, uh, that reads differently in, in terms of the narrative. Um, but just uh, think about what you're doing on that career break and it has to be more than preparing the GMAT and, and watching uh, reruns of Breaking Bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, yeah. Um, there, I'm just looking at a question here from Adele, what should, be ideally mentioned in the INSEAD essay on how will you progress in your company? I'm not sure that they don't really ask that question specifically. Um, I, think think they, I think they ask, um, I think the question is, you know, what what's the next, if, if you were to stay oh, at your current company, yeah. you know, what would be your, your next step? Right. I do, find, I don't know if you find this, Melissa, but I do find that people overthink that question. Yeah, absolutely. So, mm -hmm. It's really, you know, there are organizations of, 20 people and there are organizations of 20,000 people. And it's hard sometimes, particularly if you're in an industry or a company that, that they, they might not be super familiar with, um, you know, what does manager mean? What does 
VP, you know what I mean? They're just trying to really gain a sense for where do you sit in the hierarchy? Right. Um, you know, contextualize a little bit what you're doing now by telling us what you would be doing as your, as your next step. That's, that's all it is. Um, you don't need to use the entire word count. We've found um, very mm -hmm. successful. People often keep that answer very short. Yep. Yep. No, I totally agree. I think, and Dell correct us if we're, if we're not answering the, the right question there. Um, but yeah, it's usually just, yeah, what in hindsight, like what would be, what would be your next step? So maybe you're, you're at, um, you know, uh, ju junior manager level. So what's, what's your, what would be your next promotion in let's say six months, one year, you know, you can mention maybe the title that you might move to next and what those new responsibilities would include. Maybe that includes also managing some other people. Um, so just kind of giving admissions a snapshot of what that new role would look like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Has someone been, um, how someone has been doing freelancing can pick up recommenders. Okay, so I think we can kind of frame this as it, not specific to freelancers, but maybe um, you, have, you work for a family business or um, you're an entrepreneur and you don't really have anyone that you report to. So yeah, I think it's, it's, it's tricky sometimes to pick a recommender in, in, several, in several cases. So um, in this case, um, it's best to probably use like people like a client uh, or a supplier, someone that really knows you well. I mean, it's good to get a, a look at, take a look at the questions that the schools are actually asking you um, to see. And then before you actually ask those recommenders, see if they can actually address those questions. Um, anything else on that, Cassandra? I'm trying to think of for freelancing in particular. I guess it would just yeah. be mostly clients or, or from a previous company that you worked at. It's okay yeah. to use a previous employer. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, again, just kind of extrapolating away from, from somebody's exact situation. Um, you know, people have the situation if they're working in family businesses, if they're entrepreneurs themselves. Um, but the criteria is going to be the same, right? We're, we go back to one of those early slides. We said it's you know somebody who knows you well, somebody who can speak to the impact that you've made, somebody who's really in your corner and is going to recommend you enthusiastically, um, whether that's a client um, because you are a freelancer or because you own your own business um, or, you know, it could be an investor. Um, certainly if you're in a family business and, you know, your, your immediate supervisor is your mom or dad, um, you know, they shouldn't write your recommendation. Um, and, and so you might also be in that, in that same situation. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Varun is asking uh, around um, private equity and sustainable engineering MBA options post post MBA. Um, not sure on the specifics of sustainable like engineering per se, but private equity. Anything you can comment on that, Cassandra? Yeah, I mean, look, both both programs um, have people going into PE either immediately after graduation or after a couple of years of um, investment banking. Investment banking. Um, mm -hmm. Look, it's one of the hardest career um, transitions to make. Uh, yeah. Everybody knows that. Uh, and so you're, in your application, if that is the career uh, trajectory that you want to follow, my strong recommendation is to really demonstrate that you have done the, some of the legwork now and that you are going to put in the legwork to try to make that career change happen beyond just utilizing the resources of the career center, which you, of course, will, will have, or career services, which you, of course, will have. They'll want to see um, that you've really done your research, you know, understood target institutions, are already doing your networking, um, and really make that, that case um, to, to what you want to do in the future. Now, you don't have as many words to do that with your, in the INSEAD application as you do with the LBS application, which means that, you know, at your INSEAD application, you need to be ready to be grilled on how you intend to make that transition happen um, during your, your interviews. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's a question here from Mahir. Um, so does working with foreign clients like in US and Canada based while being based in India count as international experience? Yes, absolutely. So we did, we did mention this. This is part of um, one of the things that you can kind of weave in through the career essays, for example, just to showcase that you've been dealing with some international clients and more than welcome to mention from where, from where those, um, those clients are based. Yeah. Okay. And maybe we might have time for, for one or two more, Melissa here. I see one about um, non-traditional backgrounds, atypical backgrounds. You know, maybe you, you know, you studied the classics 
or, you know, uh, philosophy and maybe don't come from a business background or a commercial background? How important is it that you that you have a commercial background uh, or that you are from a typical, what we call a typical MBA profile? What do you think, Melissa? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, the schools love diversity. What can I say? So if you don't come from a, like a business type background or um, yeah, that's, that can actually set you apart from, from other candidates to show, you know, what you've been doing. Um, you know, we've seen everything in the classrooms, you know, from, from professional pianists or um, singers or athletes or you name it. So, um, you know, as long as you can show that in, well, I guess to show what you'd like to do post MBA uh, is really important that you really need the MBA to fill those gaps and to learn, you know, things like marketing, accounting, finance, and so on, um, um, which will help you to gain that post MBA goal, assuming that it would be in business. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe a kind of a related question um, uh, is those people who are coming from startup land, right? At, uh, mm -hmm. So they work in startups, um, very flat organizations, um, maybe, you know, they're not being promoted. I mean, I, I have a couple of friends who have done startups and, you know, whatever their job title is doesn't really mean much because everybody does everything, right? I mean, that's that's what it's like in startup. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do they show that that progression when, you know, they're going to be potentially be in the quote unquote same job on paper for however long they've they've been there? Yeah, oh, I've worked with a lot of people from startups. Um, and yeah, as, as they might not have as much opportunity to show career progression, and, but it's really just, you know, what to showcase what they've been doing at the startup, how hard they've been working, any results that they've achieved so far, um, funding they've received, you know, what what's the plan look like, maybe they're not making any revenue right now, but they've got this projected plan. Um, that's maybe a great reason why you want to go and pursue an MBA is to gain those skills to help uh, maybe you want to go back to the startup and help it grow. Um, so it's a great opportunity, a great reason as to why you want this MBA. Um, or maybe you're trying to get out of that startup and try something new. Yeah. Um, so think yeah. in terms of your, 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 your growth, you know, not necessarily right. your title growth, but your growth, how you've grown as a professional and the mm -hmm. impact that you can show that you have had and made uh, in the, in your time there. And then I would say third, for those of us who have, uh, you know, we work with, um, people who worked in startups, not every startup is successful. So sometimes, um, also showing the self-reflection and the learning journey you had, um, if your startup wasn't successful can, can be, um, something that strengthens your application as well. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for all these great questions. I, I'm not, I don't think we got to all of them, but very happy to take them after the session. You can email us at info at fortunaadmissions.com. Um, and once again, if um, um, if anyone's interested in, you know, having their profile reviewed or have specific questions about their profile, uh, maybe you're, you want a little bit more information on school selection, um, maybe you're interested in working with a coach, you're not sure, you want to learn a bit more about how that works, you can reach out to us anytime at fortunaadmissions.com and we're happy to do a free consultation. Uh, for around 30 minutes or so. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope we were able to answer a lot of your questions and wish you all the best of luck with your INSEAD and LBS applications. Yes, best of luck, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.